Yes, hello and welcome everybody. It's Chris here from the Ministry of Dice and I'm back again today with another one of my show and tell OP kit retrospectives. Yes, that's right. This is the second instalment now. I have recently managed to complete my organized play kit collection through hustling and trading from all over the world. And now I'm going back over these cards, taking a look at the promos that were included in the sets and talking a little bit about the comic book storylines and lore that have inspired and surrounded these OP kits. And in this installment, I'm going to take a look at a set that accompanied the Uncanny X-Men expansion, the Dark Phoenix Saga set. Okay then, let's start with a little bit of context for anyone not in the know, and let's begin talking about the idea of organised play kits. So organised play kits, if you didn't hear my explanation in the last instalment, although please do go give that a watch if you're if you interested to know. Uh, organised play kits, they were loosely supposed to be monthly, I don't know if that ever really actually happened, but WizKids produced a set of three card promos, that were provided to local gaming stores to award at their local level gaming events. And these would often have two of the cards with a limited print run and then a third card with a larger print run with the intention of awarding the two smaller numbered ones uh, for first place, second place and for you know fellowship stroke sportsman award. And then the third with the larger print run uh, intended to be awarded as the door prize as the participation prize. And the Uncanny X-Men expansion had three sets that came with it in total. Today I'm just focusing on the first set, the Dark Phoenix Saga set. And uh, these have continued up until recent years. In fact, in uh, just last year, in, in 2019, we had uh, a number of sets produced as well. Uh, and so there, there's your contact list on the organised play kits. Uh, some were just reprints with alt art on them, with the game text that matched it, what was in the expansion that they were aligned to. Others were brand new promos with their own game texts attached to them, just to make them a little bit more special and a little bit more interesting. Now let's talk about the context of the storyline. So the Dark Phoenix Saga. Here's my battered old copy from, from the mid-80s. My old trade paperback collection. So you can see the cover's absolutely annihilated. I've read it that many times. Um, but this was from a period of time in the X-Men narrative that was being written by Chris Claremont. It was the Uncanny X-Men title specifically that this was centred around. The The core of the Dark Phoenix saga takes place, I think it's issue 100 or 101, up until around issue 106, 107, although the events uh, of the Dark Phoenix saga were being warmed up to long before this point, and also the ramifications of it are still being felt in the X-Men comic book today. Many would consider this the kind of seminal, you know, the absolute peak, one of the most significant uh, events in X-Men lore. Um, and it is it's definitely been a kind of trope that the X-Men storylines have returned to many, many times. It, it was a point in the X-Men history where there was a Chris Claremont was, uh, had made it a little darker, a little grittier. He'd modernised it and made it feel more relevant to comic book reading audiences of the 70s and 80s. Uh, kind of stepped a little bit away from the sort of campy look and feel of the Stan Lee era, uh, as legendary as it was. Um, and also was the point where many new characters who are now considered kind of classic regulars in X-Men stories like Wolverine, Colossus, Storm, Kitty Pride, um, Warpath, etc, etc, were all kind of introduced in, uh, oh, Banshee, Sean Casty, Moira McTaggart and the whole McTaggart Island stuff was, was introduced and much of the, the lore that is revisited and has speaks to this personality of the X-Men from our modern day view was informed by this period of time in the comic books. Okay, let's take a look at our first card from the set then. We're going to start with Marvel Girl Humanity here. Five cost bolt, X-Men affiliation. Her game text reads, when you are attacked, you may spin up Marvel Girl one level if you do gain two life. And I'm pretty sure, although someone let me know in the comments below, I'm pretty sure that's that's an alt art reprint of the um, Marvel one of the Marvel Girl cards that appears in the Uncanny X-Men set. Now, one thing that's particularly interesting, and uh, you'll notice this with all three cards in the set, even though it focuses on the Dark Phoenix Saga storyline, the artwork isn't taken from the original John Byrne, Chris Claremont um, 
Dark Phoenix Saga run. In fact, this one I think was a cover, uh, as is uh, the Dark Phoenix, uh, from a, uh, a title called X-Men Unlimited, which was released in the 2000s. So an interesting choice by WizKids uh, to focus on a particular story arc, but then to uh, use artwork from from later uh, revisits of that. And in fact, this, this cover here, you can see there's aspects of the Jean Grey character and psyche and how it's been formed and built uh, as a result of her experiences with the Phoenix and the Dark Phoenix saga and many other things. She goes through the mill and continues to go through the mill every every issue, does Jean Grey. So Jean Grey Marvel Girl, she's a founding member of the original X-Men team, along with Cyclops, Beast, Iceman, Angel, and of course Professor X himself. She is a telepath, a telekinetic, a psychic, and all other mind powery things you can think of, really, she can do. She there's a lot of storyline that centers around her, particularly her relationship with Cyclops, which is well documented. They've been in a long-standing relationship since they were teenagers, and that plays a part in the storyline of the Dark Phoenix saga to to quite a, an extensive degree. Um and the X-Men, just prior to the kind of Dark Phoenix saga stuff kicking off, are battling um, a, 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 an anti-mutant activist called Dr. Stephen Lang, he says, wondering if his memory is failing him there. And Dr. Stephen Lang, is he's taken over an abandoned US government satellite and has been messing around with anti-mutant sentinel technology and the X-Men get a team together, uh, take a shuttle up into space to go and defeat him and put an end to the Sentinel technology thing that he's doing that's targeting mutants. They succeed. Uh, however, on their return to Earth, there is a strange solar flare phenomenon going on that is affecting the integrity and the instrumentation in the shuttle, and the entire team is at risk of dying. And as a result of this, Jean Grey, using her telepathic powers, sorry, her telekinetic powers, because why would telepathy help you keep a space shuttle together? She flies out into space using her powers to hold the integrity of the, of the shuttle together, knowing that it's most likely a suicide mission to save the lives of the rest of the team. However, the strange solar flare activity and her telekinetic powers have a strange effect on one, and one another, and when the X-Men return to Earth, they splash down into the ocean. When they return to Earth, she hasn't died but her powers have been amplified, they've been turned up, and she's taken on this new identity of the Phoenix. This is where her famous uh, Phoenix uniform begins, but in the green and yellow combination of colours that echo back to her original green and yellow uniform, um, but with the Phoenix symbol on the chest and you know the scarf tied around her waist and the boots and stuff. Um, and so she re-emerges as the Phoenix, and the X-Men are starting to observe through the transformation of her powers and the amplification of her powers that her outlook and behaviour is starting to change somewhat. And as a result, uh, Marvel Girl Jean Grey put some psychic blocks in place with the assistance of Professor X to keep that almighty power that she suddenly, suddenly got from somewhere in check. Right, okay then, so the next card in the set we're going to take a look at is Emma Frost, White Queen. She's a five-cost shield, she's a villain, got the old Marvel Hydra uh, villain affiliation symbol. Her game text reads, when fielded, you may pay a shield to replace an opposing fist character with a sidekick from the opponent's use pile. Now let's talk about how she's involved and why she's a significant character to include in this set. Emma Frost is part of a secret society of mutants called the Hellfire Club. These are a bunch of um, like legacy family moneyed individuals who are manipulating political events around the world and financial events around the world for their own gain. And Emma Frost is a telepath, telekinetic type psychic person too. And she senses, feels the sudden increase in power on Jean Grey. And so the Hellfire Club put in motion a plan to manipulate Jean Grey, to psychically manipulate her using the abilities of a member called Mastermind, uh, sometimes referred to as Jason Wingard, to recruit Jean Grey, turn her evil, recruit Jean Grey, and bring her into the fold so that they can use her almighty power for their own ends. 
And so uh, Jason Wingard appears, he's in quite a few issues. He appears as he takes these steps to psychically manipulate Jean Grey, break down those psychic barriers that she's created around herself to release that almighty power. He's doing it through some weird thing around making her believe that she's an ancestor, uh, an ancestor of herself who was a member of the Hellfire Club and they, you know, they get married in the psychic dreams and stuff. That's all a bit convoluted. All you need to know is that he's messing with her head. He's messing with her head, but in a way like a psychic messes with her head. And um, he eventually manages to break all those barriers down, push a kind of personality transformation in Jean Grey, and she becomes a member of the Hellfire Club and adopts the role of their Black Queen, Emma Queen's equal but it doesn't work they managed to succeed up to that point but it doesn't work and it doesn't work for a couple of reasons uh, the first reason is that Jean Grey has a psychic bond with Cyclops that's been forged through their romantic relationship over the years they were together since they were teenagers uh, and they use it to communicate if, if for no other reason you'll have seen it in the films and in the cartoons you know Jean Grey creating these telepathic messaging systems um, but they have this bond and so a telepathic fight takes place between Mastermind and Cyclops and Cyclops manages to defeat him in the telepathic realm so that it kind of snaps her out of it in the real realm it, in fact it looks like Cyclops dies it looks like Jason Wingard has won and uh, that's the kind of thing the love of her life on the floor dying is the thing that kind of snaps her out of it but the second thing that happens is that because they've been messing with Red Cyclically so much and because they've broken down all those psychic barriers that she put around her new powers she is so strong so almighty powerful that they are unable to control her. And so she goes back in the fold with the X-Men, but there's something still going on there under the surface of it all. Um, and we see her very aggressively take down Emma Frost, the White Queen, and we also see her take uh, steps to have revenge on Mastermind, where she opens his mind up to the entire universe and sends him insane, sends him mad with all the knowledge of every planet across the universe. So, the last card then, here we go. Phoenix, Dark Phoenix, seven cost bolt. Villain affiliation, again with the old Hydra villain symbol. Her game text reads, When fielded, KO a target character with the X-Men affiliation. If that character is named Wolverine or Cyclops, deal two damage to its owner. So, a very thematic game text there. In the storyline... I just mentioned the White Queen and Mastermind and their manipulation of, of Jean Grey. Even though she comes back into the fold with the X-Men briefly to defeat the Hellfire Club, all the aggression that she's used to combat the White Queen and the aggression she's used to send Mastermind insane and just generally the shenanigans of the Hellfire Club's telepathic manipulation of her, she finally snaps. She turns completely wholly into the Dark Phoenix. She takes on the red uniform she gets the phoenix fiery energy about her the glowing red eyes and everything that we can see in the image here uh, speaking of the image i mentioned before so this is another example it's not from the original dark phoenix saga in fact this is from a cover from x-men unlimited i think uh, issue 210 211 ish um from an instance where the dark phoenix events are still reverberating this was the issue it was published uh, with this cover was in 2004 and it, Professor X is kind of reflecting back on um, some, some subsequent Dark Phoenix-related events, and this is the cover for that, but uh, anyway. Um, so she finally becomes the Dark Phoenix, and the X-Men have to resolve themselves to, to defeating who, someone who was once their ally, once their friend, and in Cyclops' case, once their lover. Uh, in fact, the game text is super thematic because I mentioned Cyclops being her lover. Uh, Wolverine is named on the card as well because at this point in X-Men history, and this has been reused in the movies and the cartoons a number of times, at this point in X-Men history, Wolverine, Cyclops and Jean Grey had quite a complicated love triangle thing going on where Wolverine had feelings for Jean Grey. She kind of sort of had feelings for him too, but of course she was with Cyclops. Cyclops kind of knew that they had feelings for each other. It was all very complex. Uh, and again, one of the other elements of Chris Claremont's uh, character relationships that still resonate with the characters e even in publications today um, so they resolve to try and defeat her they, she gets the better of them in the first instance but then Professor X's psychic powers are, are able to bring her around but before he does 
one key event in the storyline is that the Dark Phoenix realises that it is cosmically powerful and takes to the stars. She just does one and shoots up into the sky and into space where she finds a star to feed upon, to power this new psychic energy that is being driven by the Phoenix Force. This star and the act of devouring this star causes an inhabited planet to explode and therefore the phoenix is responsible for the entire decimation of a civilization on this planet this is where the story starts to get a little bit more complex because as she returns to earth they are able to defeat her and she comes back she manages to get the psychic blocks back in place with professor x's help to control her powers but the act of genocide essentially that she commits as the dark phoenix as the phoenix force feeds off that star is observed by the shi'ar empire and this is a um an imperial alien um alliance union across star systems uh, led by their queen Lilandra who the X-Men are familiar with actually the uh, professor X used to be her boyfriend in some previous you know interplanetary adventures that the X-Men had and so the Shi'ar empire rook up just as Jean Grey and Professor X are getting to grips with these new powers and putting these psychic blocks in place so that she can restrain herself from the overwhelming aggression and destruction that the Phoenix Force wants her to commit and takes her back to the home planet at the centre of the Empire, the Shi'ar Empire, to face charges and go to trial for the genocide that she committed. Professor X, though, because he had a bit of knowledge about the Shi'ar Empire traditions and ins and outs because he had a bit of time, you know, out there hanging out with Lilandra and what have you getting busy um says that he wants trial by combat and puts up the entire team of x-men against Lilandra's imperial guard they then get taken to a battle planet where the x-men and these imperial guard uh, start fighting in order to win Jean Grey's li- right to live however Jean Grey consumed by the guilt of her acts as the Dark Phoenix, decides to give up her life in order to end the the conflict with the Shi'ar Empire, but also as penance for what she what she did as the Dark Phoenix, uh, and disappears in like a big ball of light thing, um, which of course breaks the team apart. Cyclops, as her boyfriend, you know, is destroyed by this. Wolverine, because he carries his feelings of love for Jean Grey, is also destroyed by it. The team, you know, Storm treats her like a sister. Um, and this leads into other storylines and other ramifications down the line. And, you know, at this point, Jean Grey returns. There's a whole convoluted thing about a clone and then another clone. And there's a clone called Madeline Pryor, but then there was a clone of Jean Grey. But this wasn't the real Jean Grey. It might have been a clone of Jean Grey in the first place. A lot of hardcore X-Men fans don't really go for the the, the clone Jean Grey thing. But there's a storyline with Madeline Pryor. And this is where Cable comes in story. It, it's It's a whole thing. Um, but that's how the Dark Phoenix saga concludes the Phoenix Force as I say becomes a trope in the X-Men universe comes back time and time again Uh, as a cosmic entity it is attracted to these almighty psychic talents that keep generating on Earth Uh, Rachel Summers who is Jean Grey's daughter uh, enters into the story as a host for this cosmic entity Uh, Jean Grey who is the past Jean Grey who's brought into the present day attracts it Hope Summers as I talked about with the Avengers vs X-Men storyline has an encounter with it emma frost and the stepford cuckoos who are another group of psychics and quentin choir all have experiences with the phoenix force and of course the phoenix five in the avx storyline so it becomes a a long-standing cornerstone of the x-men lore and it all came from this original publication in 1979 so there we go folks that is the dark phoenix saga set and the comic book lore that that sits behind it it is such a dense period in X-Men history that I, I really only scratched the surface there. I've popped a link in the description for the trade paperback versions through a series called X-Men Milestones, if you want to take a look at that. If you buy it through that link also, that's a way to support the Ministry of Dice because we're an Amazon affiliate there. Um, but in the meantime, again, let me know feedback. Do you want me to carry on with these? I'm quite happy to do so. I really enjoy talking about all these old comic book storylines um, and finish it, certainly finish out the Uncanny X-Men. But in the meantime, please do hang around and enjoy the two videos on the right-hand side of the screen that the YouTube algorithm thinks that you might enjoy. And I'll catch you on a podcast, on a video, or writing a blog post on BritRoller6.com sometime soon. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.